I want to tell you about Joy, a 12-year-old girl who lives in Boston whose parents are friends of mine. Like all 12-year-olds, Joy dreams about being done with middle school. She dreams about her birthday, playing with her puppy, riding her bicycle. But unlike a lot of 12-year-olds, she has a thick, viscous mucus that builds up in her body. In her lungs, this mucus traps bacteria, clogs her airways, and causes respiratory failures. In her pancreas, it prevents her body from absorbing nutrients, which would make her strong. Joy has cystic fibrosis, and it's all because of a very small mutation on her seventh chromosome. Cystic fibrosis profoundly affects, reduces Joy's ability to learn, to play with her puppy, to enjoy life, and to blow the candles out on her birthday cake. She's priceless to me and to her parents, and so we are willing to spend any amount of money to get her whatever cure or treatment that she might need. And this is where the ideas of value-based pricing can be so useful to us because they help us understand the maximum amount that we're willing to pay for treatments that could benefit a patient. The idea, and you're all familiar with it, is simple. Let's pay more for drugs that generate more life and reduce more suffering, and let's pay less for drugs that do less. So let me ask you all something. Do you like this idea? I like it. I like it. But it's also a very incomplete idea, and it's likely to be even more incomplete in the years to come. Why? Well, what if all the drugs start to become tremendous drugs? What will be the value-based price for tremendous drugs? What happens when the value-based price for tremendous drugs is legitimately in the millions of dollars? What do we do then? And if you look at new medical innovations, particularly those that are likely to arise out of CRISPR-Cas9 technologies, where we literally edit the defective gene in Joy's chromosome, much like I would edit a typo with the word processor, we might soon find cures that are able to do exactly this. First generation treatments are likely to be for monogenic diseases, like cystic fibrosis, like Usher's 2A, Duchenne's, rapidly progressing neurodegenerative disorders like Tay-Sachs, severe metabolic diseases like urea cycle disorders. But second generation treatments might be able to do something even more complicated. We might be able to do at the genetic level what current treatments are able to do at the RNA level for horrible diseases like spinal muscular atrophy. So soon, in our lifetime, we may not just be seeing two or three cures or 30 cures, but 300 cures. And I haven't even mentioned regenerative medicine. The price of those cures, the value-based price for those cures, cures that generate 80 years of life, ought to be more than $5 million. It's $5 million or more because we would take the number of years of life that these cures generate, 80, and multiply by the value of the life. What would we do then? We would have to use patients like Joy as hostages in a price negotiation and say, we are willing to let you suffer, atrophy, waste away, and potentially die if you, the manufacturer, don't give us the value-based price. And even if the manufacturer gave us the value-based price, we still need to come up with the millions probably billions to pay those value-based prices. And if they didn't give us the value-based price, we would have to go to Joy and her family and say, we're sorry, we tried, we didn't get the value-based price, you die. People, patients, voters, economists, will say, this is not fair. So we need to think well beyond value-based pricing as we start to think about curative drugs and technologies. And so let me propose three ideas, starting with the simplest one. First, first, we're going to have to be sure that sick people and healthy people pay the same insurance premiums for these diseases. It should not be the case, as some have recently proposed, 
that sick people or those with a higher genetic risk of disease pay more. If we do that, it is not insurance because they're paying more when they're sick. It is also not fair because many of them lost a genetic lottery that you or I won. But it also decimates the incentives to create these new drugs because the number of people with these genetic diseases is very small relative to the number of people without these diseases. So we have to ensure that community rating for health insurance happens. The second thing that we're going to have to get comfortable with is we're going to have to move away from getting insurance from our employers. Right now, more than half of us get health insurance through our employers. Now think about Joy's situation. Suppose she's the only child in America who needs access to a $1 million cure. If we spread the cost of that cure over the 1,000 employees who work with her parents, every employee's health insurance premiums increase by $3,000 overnight. That's a lot of money. Now imagine we could spread the risk of her one cure to a population the size of the city of Boston, about a million people. The price of that $3 million cure now falls to $3. But imagine an insurance pool that had 300 million people in it. The price of the cure becomes one cent. So as these cures arrive, we are going to have to be a lot more comfortable with this idea of enormous insurance pools, because that's really the only way that we're going to be able to pay for these cures. It is going to disrupt a lot of insurance businesses. But here's a third thing that we should be thinking about. Government should be taking a much more active role in the development of curative therapies. What we want for these therapies is a new agency that looks a lot like a NASA for drug development. And just like NASA paid Rockwell and General Dynamics to build a space shuttle, we want this new agency to work with hospitals, great universities, and great pharmaceutical companies to build and develop these drugs with one difference. The intellectual property associated with these drugs should belong to the government. If other countries want to participate in this enterprise, they're welcome to, and they can also have the drugs for cheap. This new agency should be allowed to buy patents at market prices. It should be allowed to announce prizes for patents that we would like to see discovered. But also, let me be very clear, this agency would be extremely different than what we refer to as the NIH. And it would be very different than the NIH for a variety of reasons. The NIH does a lot of basic science, but it doesn't do drug development. We're talking about an agency that does basic science, that does drug development, that launches clinical trials, goes through the FDA, and brings these drugs to market. But also, different than the NIH, it would be insulated from the vagaries of congressional temperament. Drug discovery is very long and, and fraught with failure. And it is impossible to do drug discovery if your budget can get ravaged by the temperament of who is in Congress. So those are some general ideas for the NASA for drug discovery strategy. What would its advantages be? First, the obvious advantage is that when we get the drugs, we will be able to give it to people immediately for very, very low price. Why? Because we own the intellectual property. We could give drugs away to countries much poorer than ours who will never be able to afford these drugs for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's a terrific advantage of this strategy. The second advantage of this strategy is that we could alter where the innovation is happening. Right now, Innovation is led by for-profit companies who pursue profit. And one challenge with that is that they are drawn to areas of disease research where profits are high but prevalence may or may not be high. We could change all of that by saying we want drugs, we want cures for diseases that afflict children and not the elderly. We want cures for infectious diseases and not always for chronic disease. We want cures and treatments for people, for, for people who are poor and not really rich. And that is something that we're going to be able to do if we're able to direct a lot of the research. The third advantage is that we might actually be able to reduce the cost of the R&D itself. Why? Well, 
when companies engage in competition, they are incented to bring drugs to market very, very quickly, but they're also incented to hoard information on failures. And so there's a lot of duplication that happens in drug discovery, which doesn't really need to happen. And that would go away if you had a single agency that learned from failures along the way. So that's a third extremely important advantage of why this enterprise, with a lot of challenges, might actually have many advantages as well. But let me be clear. I'm also very concerned that this may not work. An agency hooked up to the United States Treasury doesn't usually sound like a very good idea. <laughs> it might make a lot of mistakes. It might not take enough risks. It may just not have the appetite to make investments in things that take 30 years to discover. And unlike today's biopharma companies, it will not be answerable to the stinging discipline of financial markets when it makes those mistakes. This enterprise will also be expensive. Today's biopharma companies invest $150 billion every year doing R&D. So suppose we wanted to replicate half that effort. We need $75 billion. There are many ways to come up with $75 billion, but just to put that number into perspective, we could come up with $75 billion if we increase taxes on the top 20% of Americans by 1%. So these are families that on average earn about $330,000 a year. If their taxes went up 1%, their taxes would go up by the equivalent of a shiny new phone, about $900. This is something that we can do, but it is extremely expensive. Is it going to work? I don't know. How would we know if it was going to work? Well, if it were working, one thing that we should be able to see is, we're putting in $75 billion. Are we getting at least $75 billion worth of life out of it? Well, what is $75 billion worth of life? Economists know the answer to questions like that. 75 billion years of life is about 500,000 live years. That's what it is. Is that a small hurdle or a large hurdle? 500,000 life years is 1% of 1% of the global burden of disease. And the scientists in the room tell me that this is within their scientific grasp. But as an economist, I can also tell you that it is within our economic grasp because $75 billion a year is way less than half a percent of our GDP. And so we would be able to offer tremendous drugs to millions of people, allowing them to live to their capabilities. Am I crazy? Well, yes. <laughs> I'm crazy like a fox. But joy is waiting for us. And that is what pricing the priceless is all about. Thank you.